Well, hello, everyone. Um, thanks for taking a few minutes to be able to uh, sit with me and uh, walk through this content. We're going to be talking about a, a concept that um, maybe at least the terminology may be unfamiliar, uh, but hopefully uh, it is familiar, at least in, in our uh, a common aim. It's called contributor centric systems. And I'm Joel Worrell, um, Senior Director of Open Source from New Relic, and uh, glad to be walking you through this material today. Um, so for starters, as is always the case, I got to start off here with my little safe harbor slide and uh, just say anything that I'm talking about related to New Relic, obviously, is related to that. So, um, okay, for starters here, uh, just give you just a quick a moment about me. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I currently serve as the Senior Director of Open Source at New Relic. Um, and previously, I've worked at New Relic for about two and a half years um, in uh, running open source for the last year. Uh, before that, I ran a group inside our go-to-market organization called New Relic Labs. Um, I've been a chief technologist for a nonprofit marketing firm. I've been a nonprofit executive and, um, and served at all sorts of different levels of, of uh, engineering leadership in um, product companies. Um, I'm also an open source maintainer and the co-founder of a project that actually was part of the second application based uh, uh, a project that ever actually joined the JS Foundation, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about. Um, I've run marketing organizations before, um, solution architect, I've been a, been a teacher and developer. Um, and I've also been a, a New Relic customer, which is the company that I'm working for uh, these days. So throughout the interwebs, you can find me if you're interested uh, at my handle, which is almost always available, which is why I use it, uh, Tango Llama. Okay, so here's our agenda. Uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, first of all, before you get all the way through this talk, why this talk? Uh, so I'm gonna give you just a couple thoughts about why this might be valuable for you. I'm gonna give you some background, um, uh, some context about uh, how this concept came about from some of my own experiences. We're gonna talk about a definition around contributor-centric systems. I'm gonna talk about six principles that um, I believe have played out in the work that I've done around uh, building contrib contributor-centric systems and then offer just a few next steps for you as you're thinking about um, exploring this concept, applying this concept, hopefully learning with me in the uh, process of, um, of building systems that uh, invite and engage contribution and, and engage contributors. Okay, so for starters, I like this very pointed question. Why is this worth 30 minutes, minutes of my time? I'll never get back. Um, so I wanna just offer up these three uh, potential outcomes. So first of all, to get better as a software professional, um, I think uh, regardless of which particular discipline we're operating in, in the world of technology, uh, whether it's architecting systems, engineering them, uh, discovering, product needs and fits, uh, inventing. Um, you grow your experiences from other people's journeys. And my hope is by presenting a little bit of my own journeys in, in uh, exploring this concept, it could be beneficial to you. Um, second, there's a good chance now or sometime in the future, you will be working on a system that would benefit from some of these ideas, some contributor-centric ideas. And, um, and so that doesn't, that's not to imply that every project you do work on or even every open source project necessarily should be what I would classify as like a contributor centric system, but, but, but it's very likely that you will be. And so perhaps this would be applicable from that perspective. And then the third thing is just to change perspective on the way you are doing your work. Um, uh, just by thinking about how this type of concept applies to your own work, you might just find uh, that you find just a little bit more purpose in your craft, which I think is one of the things that's happened for me. So um, without further ado, we're gonna continue on. Okay, so we're going to talk about uh, a couple stories. First of all, we're gonna talk about um, an anti-pattern to this concept of contributor-centric systems from my own background, which happens to come from the enterprise learning management system space, which is uh, certainly not to disparage um, companies are doing good work there, but it is to say that there's some experience that I personally had that helped me kind of recognize that it felt like it wasn't aligned with some of the things we we're really trying to accomplish. And then I'm going to point to uh, three different examples of uh, projects that I've worked on in my career over the last 10 plus years um, that have grown some of my own thinking about what a contributor-centric system is. 
um, in the nonprofit space, in the open source space, and now working in a commercial entity leading open source. Okay, so um, item number one, our anti-pattern. And for this, we're gonna point to, uh, this is, of course, you've probably seen this before, uh, Gartner Magic Quadrant. This one I think is a little bit older, but it's meant to chart out you know, all the leading players that exist in a, a particular sector of software. One of the things that, so I, I found myself uh, working and leading in a learning management company um, a decade plus ago. And one of the things I was always struck with was um, the relationship that we had with learners as a software vendor that was theoretically all about learning. Um, we, we were a system that uh, through um, choice or enforcement uh, had had uh, been rolled out across large enterprises, so thousands, tens of thousands, in some cases hundreds of thousands of users are touching the software on a regular basis. Um, and it was clear uh, through the way we built features, through the way we did our, our product road mapping, through even frankly the way we were evaluating compared with other peers, that we were not building the software for the learners, for the people who were like the broadest audience of people that were touching the software, we're really building it for learning administrators who are trying to figure out how to justify their budgets uh, to uh, their, their executives. Um, and that created this weird imbalance where there's just disconnect uh, for me as an engineer and an inventor, a cognitive disconnect between like the power of what existed in our learning community and how it could serve the ultimate goals we had about retaining and conveying knowledge um, versus the way we were actually thinking about building the software. So I kind of walked away from that experience uh, back uh, 10, 11, 12 years ago now um, with these burning questions in my head about what would it mean to actually truly engage um, the, the people that you're trying to serve in a, in a way that created more, uh, more generous outcomes. Um, not in just truly in, in some in an altruistic way, but like ultimately really about, about building more productive systems and accomplishing your, your tasks more successfully. Uh, I quit that job um, and actually ended up joining um, a nonprofit, actually an organization I've been given to for a number of years. And I actually joined as their first technologist, the first person with any sort of technology background, and eventually ended up running technology and marketing for an organization called Cure. Um, so this was an organization that operated a, a set of hospitals all over the world um, where the focus was on caring for kids with surgically correctable disabilities. Um, and the key thing that we did there, that we built a system that was my first kind of major learning and discovery around this idea of, you know, of building contributor-centric systems. So we were building a system. Um, at the time, when I joined the organization, um, we had a, a problem, which was we were doing all this great work, 20,000 plus kids a year that are being served, and radical transformation in the lives of these children and their families. Um, but whether you showed up with $50,000 or 50, we couldn't connect those dollars to a direct human that was being helped. And we had great numbers from a uh, reporting standpoint on our 990, um, but ultimately there was a lack of connection. And so that created not only kind of an opacity in who we were serving, but even um, just a real anonymity on the side of the people who were funding the work and, and contributing as well. So what we did is we built a platform, we built a piece of technology, um, called a system called Cure Kids, that was able to connect donors and the people who were being served um, through uh, an appropriate level of update and communication, where we were able to actually broker two-way communication between families. So families that were helping fund care and then families that were receiving that care um, in very generous, mutually uh, beneficial relationships where they're both uh, serving one another and we end up becoming kind of the conduit for that. Um, so creating some interesting scenario where we actually got the, got the chance to help our donors feel like they were directly involved in our work and not just help them feel like it because it's the same beneficial from a fundraising perspective, although it was, um, but also to actually get them directly involved in some of the work that we did um, through the use of the technology system. I'll talk about that a little bit more when I get into, uh, get into some of the takeaways. The second thing, and while I was in the middle of working for that organization, uh, myself and, and two other co-founders, started a project um, that's now part of uh, the Linux Foundation, part of the JS Foundation, um, called Hospital Run. So uh, we, uh, I was actually on a, on a trip um, visiting our hospital in Kenya um, and had known for a while, I was there actually checking the efficacy of this patient reporting system that I 
just talked about the cure kid system and uh, was fully aware that like we had a problem from a medical records standpoint that we needed to at some point implement an electronic medical record system, um, but ended up going out on a mobile clinic and recognized, and a mobile clinic, just to be clear, is like a, a situation where say uh, one of these facilities would uh, get in some uh, hospital vans and then drive maybe several hundred kilometers away from their facility to do long-term follow-up and care um, and patient identification um, in you know some other neighboring village in, in order to like ensure that we the continuity of care was maintained but we had to carry the records actually out with us out in those scenarios so we recognized there was a really complex issue there if we were going to try to tackle this with a uh, technology system and so what we need to do was reluctantly after exploring a lot of different options and exploring a lot of the open source projects that were out there we started a project um, that made use of a, a, a technology concept called offline first development in order to allow you to um, interact with the cloud-based system even when the internet's off because we're using local storage and then some uh, simple but clever synchronization capabilities to when you're in range of an internet connection, then recognize where you are and know which network you can talk to and how to transmit the updates uh, appropriately. And what we ended up having to do was ultimately build a open source project around that and then build some way to bake into the concepts of what we were building with Hospital Run, a contributor centricity. Um, so we had a, a number of practices that we started implementing in the way that we were managing that project that were all about make creating an environment that allowed potential contributors, these developers that happened to be at that time building an Ember-based application. Since then, the project's continued on and it's now a React-based app, but uh, they, they understood a particular framework and understood a particular set of technology and carried that knowledge into the conversation, but didn't necessarily understand the domain perfectly. So how do we find ways to help people feel connected and get connected to that work in service to this common mission? And there were a lot of interesting challenges that we faced along that way um, and what it meant to like discover what does it actually mean to be contributor centric what are the things that aid your ability to recruit um, and encourage and maintain contributors um, some of which are a little bit counterintuitive and i'll talk a little bit about those when i get into sections on on lessons learned a third piece of, um, of input here is actually on uh, the work that i'm doing right now uh, related to new relics so um, I joined New Relic, as I said, about two and a half years ago, and then took over the open source organization. Um, actually, really, we really started it uh, back in October of 2019. And, and like a lot of other organizations, there was a lot of uh, uh, tending work to be done in order to help us uh, discover policy, implement that policy, um, create culture around what did it mean for us to open source more of our capabilities as an organization. <clears throat> Nowadays, we've open sourced basically our entire instrumentation library so all our agents and capabilities soon to be our capabilities from a browser and mobile perspective are all now uh, out in open source and some of that was actually driven by a lot of the work that came out of the open source engineering team not that we had done conducted all that work but that we kind of led the way on what does it mean to create a contributor centric culture and so we did things like um, release our open source website so you can go to opensource.newrelic.com this is a, a screenshot of it um, and that, of course, itself is an open source project, right? So our website that's focused on promoting these hundreds of projects that we have in our open source library on GitHub is itself an open source project built in Gatsby um, that invites things like direct contribution to the maintenance and management of the site. So you'll find that on every page, there are things like editing capabilities that drive you directly into an interface that you can quickly edit and PR. Um, all focused on this idea of like recognizing if someone's willing to take an action to contribute um, in say even a language change on something that could be a good basis to try to determine whether or not you've got someone who might be interested in being involved in some of the other projects you're involved in <clears throat> and ultimately all in service to the, the mission we have which is not about New Relic's bottom line I mean that's sort of an outcome from executing our mission but we're really focused on making observability ubiquitous and, and accessible to, um, to all engineers. And so we recognize that doing more work in open source uh, was necessary to, to achieve that and that uh, to, to create the kind of relationships with the community that makes it possible to, um, to, to build those sorts of things like 
we need to reflect that in for ourselves to change our or, or adjust our own perspectives and attitudes as well as um, in relationship with our potential contributors. How do we build systems that invite that contribution? So that leads me to um, some learning. So having been in the nonprofit space and the open source uh, uh, directly in, in uh, direct open source contribution, working in a commercial setting, um, leading open source, um, I want to talk a little bit about some common ground um, that I've uh, uh, discovered between open source and nonprofits um, that I think can be beneficial in thinking about this concept of contributor centric systems. Okay, so item number one, um, both open source and nonprofits or causes um, are, and this is the case for foundations or you know, for, uh, for any sort of 501c3 or if you're international uh, uh, based on the governance laws of your, uh, your locale, whatever qualifies as a nonprofit, that these two things are pursuing a larger goal than full-time central staff can achieve. You're always tackling a mission that's bigger than you can staff up for. Um, that is a, uh, that's a, that perhaps a, a challenge that's faced even in many commercial ventures, but I would, I would argue having been, lived on both sides of that equation, um, that it is certainly far more challenging and requires far more uh, invention and, and um, necessary investment on the nonprofit side and definitely on the open source side. Um, you are, are trying to tackle something that's really difficult for you to hire up to solve. The second thing is, you're relying on participation where financial benefit is not a primary driver. So in the case that you're, you know, perhaps like most of our work settings, we probably are working someplace because um, we like the people we're working with. Hopefully we believe in the mission of the uh, work that we're doing. Um, there certainly is a financial benefit that's a driver for our work. That's not the case. I mean, there are in many countries tax write-offs related to um, nonprofit contribution. And certainly there are some scenarios where open source contributors are paid, but certainly not the sort of thing that's meant to uh, make you rich and famous. Um, so that's not the primary driver. And, and that creates a different sort of um, requirement in the way you, that you construct your project. Third thing, they both have missions that tend to be best served by a broader circle. So um, the, the work tends to get better as more people are involved. This is not the true of every single project or certainly not every project in in a commercial setting. Um, but in this particular case, these tend to be true about open source and nonprofits. And therefore, uh, they need vibrant relationships with contributors. And so you've got to build connections with people um, who you desperately need in order to uh, uh, achieve, ultimately achieve the, the further extent of what you want to do with your mission. Okay, so this leads us to a question of this, this concept of a contributor centric system. So uh, let's talk about what is a contributor-centric system? So I've got a definition here. So a contributor-centric system is a system, technology and processes built to support and align people who are in a sustained relationship with an organization that champions a mission. And the resulting system enables a virtuous cycle of mutual service to a common cause. So think about this as like a, a scenario where as opposed to, uh, you may build software to serve a customer, but in this case actually, the customer that you're serving is actually related to like a larger cause that you're involved in. And in the, the best definition and the best implementations of a contributor centric system, the technology systems that support these things, um, the contributor, the customer that you're serving actually feels like they are a part of the actual mission because of their engagement with the technology or contribution to the technology. So that's, a, that's kind of a unique factor that, that I, I would use as a definition for what a contributor-centric system is. You're not just giving to the cause, you're a part of the cause because you're a part of it. Um, uh, so what does this look like in the case of nonprofits? Okay, so um, in a nonprofit setting, this is a platform that moves a charitable conversation about that's normally related to time or you know, some sort of time or finances that are being uh, contributed from what you, is the organization delivering this service do that the donor supports into what we as a community do to serve the common mission through our time, attention, and resources. Um, and if you're uh, an engineer like me and like tend to be a little bit more uh, uh, skeptical, say, well, really, like, what's the difference? And it's just semantics. Well, no, I mean, there is an actual um, uh, identification and emotional posture that contributors can feel towards a particular cause um, that can be enabled 
it's very common for a contributor to feel like they are sort of separate from the entity. But there is a moment, and that comes at a level that's about more than money, right, or about more than time. It's actually about like participation, really feeling like they're participating in the mission. Um, I've seen this play out in more than one uh, scenario, and it's, it's definitely possible. In an open source project, it's about building a project and tooling and processes that encourage maintainers, who are the primary people acting on the project, to engage contributors in an ever-growing sustainable connection towards uh, shared service of the project. Um, and I, I want to uh, emphasize here, indicate, uh, and I've got here as an example, the New Relic developer site, which itself is also another open source project that invites contribution on every single part of the, part of the, uh, the, uh, the site itself. That I want to want to highlight here that it is not my assumption, and this is, I suppose, debatable, but that I'm offering an opinion here. Not every open source project is a contributor, or should be a contributor-centric project, but many, many open source projects are best served by a broader circle of contributors joining in ever-increasing uh, relationship and commitment to the effort. Um, I'm not talking about you know, scattershot, hundreds of thousands of people contributing to a project, but continuing to grow the circle of people that are invested and feel invested and feel that that's a good use of their time. Okay, so um, the question is, let's say, if we, if we can take uh, as a given, or at least as a hypothesis, that the contributor-centric system is a real thing and is a thing that um, we're interested in, um, in investing in, I want to offer up just uh, six principles from that history that I just talked about, um, from this definition that I'm offering uh, around building a contributor-centric system or creating a mission-aligned experience that invites contribution. So here are the like six principles. Uh, some of these, they blend between you know, kind of marketing and positioning and then into the implementation of technology. So here we go. Item number one. Um, so I uh, just told a story uh, just a minute ago about the invention of hospital line. Um, this, uh, this photo that I brought up here is actually uh, directly related to that story. So this was uh, literally the hospital, uh, the day that hospital run as a concept really was born. I was going out on this um, this mobile clinic. We were going to drive a couple hundred miles, kilometers away from the hospital. The hospital building was right behind us. There it was a bit bigger and more, quite beautiful, actually, just such a lovely place. But um, we we uh, we dropped the, these paper records. Those are doctors that are loading uh, large, uh, heavy pieces of material onto their ambulances so that we could carry our best guess based on a region of the number of people that we might need to interact with and, and let's hope that we got the right information with us and recognizing that if we wanted to carry those medical records on an electronic device out into the field and then allow um, a staff that was not uh, uh, profoundly technically gifted, um, although incredibly gifted, capable people who were surgeons, brilliant, brilliant people, but not necessarily tech, uh, technically uh, gifted that we needed to put them in a position where they could just interact with the device. And when they walk back into their own local network, it just syncs up and works and they don't have to pay attention to it at all. And that was really the focus of what we wanted to do with the hospital. And so this, um, this first point here is really all about remembering who you're serving and why. So a contributor centric system is we're building hospital run. We recognize that we needed to bake a bunch of experiences into the way we ran the project that was actually focused on not these people, but the contributors that were actually going to help us get where we wanted to go. But we wanted to be really clear about who we were serving and why, because the contributor isn't interested in feeling like this is all about them. We were actually serving a larger mission, which is to serve these people, these people who are dedicated medical professionals taking care of children, um, or, or uh, any, any folks, that, folks that happen to be operating in a, in a majority world context. Um, where maybe there's a resource constraints, particularly related to the healthcare system. Um, so those are the people we're serving. Our value, uh, valuing that precision about who that primary customer is was super important. So as we started building Hospital Run, we recognized this technology is pretty great and actually the interface was beautiful. And so there was a, a strong pull to move it into like lots of other vectors of, you know, what you can do in Western medicine. And we would say, well, it's an open source project. You want to do that, fork it and go do whatever you want but we're hurt here for this mission. That's the reason we're doing this work. And so that actually, um, perhaps counterintuitively, focused 
what types of contributors we brought to the project and made it possible for us to build more cohesiveness and actually make a lot of progress in things like translation of the, the original platform. Anyway, that's the, they're, they're the reason, they, the, that primary customer, these, these, in this case, these positions were the reason that we had common cause with our contributors, with the people we were actually trying to serve to the way we had constructed the project. The second thing, um, communicate the mission clearly. So um, this, again, there's a couple counterintuitive ideas here um, that I, that I want to really uh, hammer home. Um, often when we start, particularly when it comes to uh, non, well, nonprofit costs as well as open source uh, projects, you're kind of searching for an idea. And I just say that like the, the, the faster you can get to a place that you're, you have conviction about the mission that you're on, um, again, counterintuitively, it casts, casting a broader net, um, it's actually unproductive. You end up meeting a lot of people who kind of like your idea um, versus being super clear about what the thing you're doing is for. Um, that actually helps people select in or out to be a part of the journey that you're asking them to enroll in. Um, and so I just wanna encourage, like you've gotta communicate that mission clearly, have conviction. Now, that's not to say that you can never evaluate like what, the, what that mission is and adjust it, but you can't do it haphazardly. I mean, you have to be intentional about that. You, you have to, and you have to be intentional about the communication if it turns out you are changing that mission. I would say anytime you do, it's fraught with danger that you know, the people who were there before have to select in or out, like are they still on that journey with you? And so be, be really clear about that. Um, item number three, um, contributors want norms and they want options. So again, this is, um, this may seem, uh, particularly when it comes to things like uh, nonprofit donations, um, this may seem uh, a little bit counterintuitive. Um, so uh, people intrinsically understand when they're contributing to work that they can do whatever, within a range, whatever they want to help. Um, so telling them that is not as useful as you might think. Actually, the most useful thing to do is to tell people what we people normally do. So the phrase, you know, I've got borrowed here, you know, people people from from Seth Godin is, you know, people like us do things like this. This this idea that like it's unintuitive, but in fact, people want to be told this is what people regularly do. You should do this too, with of course the option that you know you can do whatever you choose to do to be a part of the project. Um, and we can do this in the way that we set norms, say in our open source projects around things as simple as project templates and you know, how we enforce things like test coverage in the work that's submitted, but really setting some real clarity around, um, around a generous posture towards the way we're communicating with one another. But part of that generosity can be, can be really clear about what our norms are. Um, again, it, it lets people select, self-select in and out of what you're doing from a project standpoint. And it also gives some people handles on, you know, how do they fit into, into the potential community that you're inviting them uh, into. So uh, contributors want uh, norms with options. Number four, um, contributor engagement has to be a primary requirement. Um, it's not enough to just say, we've got a great mission, we're serving this group, um, don't you wanna help? You need to be intentional in the way you bake features into your project or into your, into your project, whether that's a nonprofit project or an open source project, that make it really clear, signal to users or potential users, potential contributors, that we want you to get involved. So we make that easy, we make it contextual. So in the case of, if you go to the open source website, clicking on that edit, edit page or create an issue doesn't just sort of randomly dump you into the GitHub repo. It takes you directly to the page you're looking at right now, where I can now go into the edit interface and issue uh, a change, submit a pull request, and then we've got systems about how we're going to validate that and check it and communicate back with you, um, and ultimately in some situations kind of reward you uh, for that work as well. So we're, we're being really contextual, and we feel like pulling some of those um, some of those user experience issues um, off the table as like additional complexities. What we're trying to signal to the user is we want you to be a part of this. Um, if you're interested, we're interested in helping you along in that process. And so the question is, you know, what can you do to make contributor experience a key feature, make a sense of openness and welcome into the mission, and treat every interaction as a, a chance for someone to self-identify that they're interested. Um, number five, 
make the experiences personal. Um, so we built one of the best features we built when I was working at Cure was we built a platform that was just a really simple concept. It was all about just sending get well messages to someone in one of our hospitals. And so we had a group of embedded bloggers. When you wrote a message as a contributor, it got sent through this embedded blogger. They could review it for content and like ensure that like there's, you know, everything's uh, appropriate there. Um, but ultimately, they'd be able to have, use it as a tool to actually have direct engagement with some of our patients. Um, and this was not just some gimmick. It had a tremendous effect in the lives of these families who appreciated the fact that someone on the other side of the world cared about what was happening to them um, and had been directly involved in it and were willing to take the time to communicate and, and often wrote back. And so there was some two-way communication we were capable of brokering. And so there's a, a natural sense, specifically as technologists, we tend to think about these efforts as like the technology sort of dehumanizes these experiences. And I would just encourage that like I've seen in the very best scenarios of the contributor centric system, the technology actually enhances the human connection. Uh, you can use the technology to shrink the world and make people talk to other people or engage with other people in ways that are appropriate, meaningful, um, in ways that like help you just recapture and remember and, and, um, and, and assert and welcome someone else's humanity. Um, and so just want to encourage you, like, that needs to be a, a key thing. What can you do to make the experiences personal and use the technology to shrink the gap? And the last thing, there's always a question when you're related to kind of these contributor uh, projects around incentives. Is it okay to have incentives? Should you give things away in relationship to, like, contributing to a particular project? And I would say absolutely. But, and the but here, is that relationship is really the incentive. Um, so you may have recognitions and rewards in your project. Um, and, you know, uh, sending someone, you know, a, a thumb drive or, you know, or anything, you know, a hat or socks or t-shirt or, you know, even something, more, you know, extensive um, is fine. But, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of hackathons where like you can win a Lego set and someone enjoyed the fact that they did that thing and they liked the Legos. Um, you know, but like that doesn't mean that they're in, not really. They haven't really indicated much of anything. What they indicated was that they liked winning or, you know, but there's, there's not relationship that you're building there. So what I encourage is that like you have to recognize the relationship to the project and the cause and what you are collectively doing is actually the incentive. That's the thing that you own and you're stewarding. And anything you offer from a recognition and reward perspective needs to be about enhancing that. You know, so if you've got swag, that swag is about tribal identity. Maybe it's something you can't buy on some store. You can only get it earned like through your engagement with the project. You know, there's an ongoing relationship about what you're going to do with your open source contributors on an annual basis. People will continue to stay connected to the project. It, all those rewards and recognitions are about feeling good about the fact that you're connected to the community. And so you need to remember relationships to key incentive. Um, so with those six ideas, um, here's what I want to offer just to close our time. Uh, just three questions to ask and answer on the journey of creating a contributor-centric system. And so here we go. Item number one, um, the question to ask yourself, are we communicating an opportunity that invites engagement? Um, what is it about the project that you're working on, the mission that you're engaged in, that leaves room um, for focused investment from a group of people that are aligned uh, with the work that you want to do. Have you created that space? And if you, if you haven't, is there space for it? It could be that there isn't, in which case then, you know, maybe that's a strategic miss. It could be that that's just where your project is, but this can help you kind of like discern if there's a, a place for more um, uh, contributor centric features. Uh, which leads to what features can we build or implement that invite contributors to grow in their direct participation. So as we look across our project, where are the places where uh, we can invite contributors to grow in their direct participation? How can we make it easier for them to do that um, so that they, they get the win and feel connected? Um, and ultimately, um, we use the technology to enhance and sustain person-to-person -person interaction. Like any of these things, if like your entire flow of the, the work that you're building to help engage with contributors doesn't result at some point with some way, whether it's through newsletters or engagement or, or meetups or 
uh, you know, or, or video conference calls, or you know, or even direct person-to-person -person interaction with the way you respond in issues and pull requests. If it's not actually uh, enhancing a sustained person-to-person -person interaction, I'd say that like you've still got work to do, um, and we do as well. I mean, in the work that I'm doing right now, we have a lot of miles to travel or kilometers, depending on where you are, um, uh, to travel in in what it means to uh, build a contributor-centric uh, uh, platform. Okay, so um, that's my talk. And I just wanna, as a final uh, uh, kind of call to action, I just say there's a, a Slack uh, for New Relic users called newrelicusers.slack.com. Um, you can join that Slack. And we have a, a public channel called Contributor Centric Systems. If this content is something that's interesting to you, um, I just encourage you, if you're interested in engaging further, um, I'm in that Slack channel and I engage there on a pretty regular basis. Um, love to talk to you about this further. I, I built this presentation or the whole concept around this um, actually as a learning exercise for myself to think about a lot of the work I had been doing and to learn more in this, uh, this area. And so uh, perhaps I can, we can learn together. Uh, so that's, uh, that's it for my presentation. And I just wanna thank you for uh, taking the last half hour or so um, to, to, to go through it. And I, I hope that you have great success in considering and building your own contributor-centric systems. Thanks.